Our English word for poetry comes from a Greek verb, poieo, which means to make. Poetry, therefore, is a kind of making, and a poem is the thing that's made. But a good poem isn't just something a poet makes. A good poem does a good bit of making on its own. A great poem can capture our imagination, can make us think differently, can explain something in the world that could not be understood in quite the same way otherwise. One of my favorite poems did that kind of work for me. It's by Linda Paston, and it's called Why Are Your Poems So Dark? Here it is. Isn't the moon dark, too, most of the time? And doesn't the white page seem unfinished without the dark stain of alphabets? When God demanded light, he didn't banish darkness. Instead, he made ebony and crows and that small mole on your left cheekbone. Or did you mean to ask, why are you sad so often? Ask the moon. Ask what it has witnessed. Well, like any great poem, Paston says quite a lot in very few words. And it's said in a way that seems meaningful and applicable beyond just Paston herself. Speaking personally and as an Old Testament professor, Paston's poem has helped me understand and to explain the Old Testament. So now when people ask me, as they frequently do, Brent, why is the Old Testament so difficult or complicated or depressing? I simply say to them, ask the moon. <laughs> ask what it has witnessed, and then I walk away. <laughs> this makes me seem very wise, almost like a guru, but at least it's an answer that has some space in it, some poetry, which means there's some room in there for me and my interlocutor to continue to talk about and discuss further. So with Paston's poem in mind and these special qualities of poetry echoing in our heads, let me make clear the claim of my talk. It's simply this that despite what you've been taught to believe, or maybe you think yourself, the Bible is not a story. Instead, the Bible is far more like a poem than it is a story, and therefore we think about Scripture better and live our lives with Scripture better when we think of the Bible as a poem, not as a story. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking right about now. It goes something like this. No way... The Bible is like totally a story. You're especially thinking that if you are uh, originally like me from uh, like Southern California. <laughs> the Bible is like totally a story you might be continuing in your head because it like begins in like Genesis with like creation and it ends in like Revelation with like new creation and in between there's like all this in between stuff, like story stuff that moves the plot from like point A to point B or or point Z, as the case may be. Now, I know that seems right, but it's just not right. And in fact, it's the in-between stuff that greatly complicates any understanding of the Bible understood as a story. I mean, first off, in-between stuff is a kind of vague category, right? I mean, we need greater clarity about what that stuff is. And when we get it, we see that a lot of that in-between stuff isn't story stuff at all. And its presence in between raises serious problems for any understanding of the Bible as a coherent, unfolding story. I mean, let's just begin with the Old Testament for a second. You could think of Genesis through the book of Numbers as telling a story, a story from creation to the boundaries of Canaan land. So far, so good. But the very next book, Deuteronomy, presses pause for 34 chapters to repeat much of what has appeared on previous episodes. <laughs> Talk about killing the suspenseful cliffhanger, right? Or extending it unduly. Well, then the next book, Joshua through Kings, tells the story of Israel's taking of the land and then losing of the land in exile and defeat. And then if you squint your eyes real tight, you might be able to see Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah as continuing that story uh, beyond the losing of the land and then back as Israel returns to the land, but then, then everything breaks down and all bets are off. In comes the book of Chronicles, which is a lot like Deuteronomy, which repeats a ton of material from Samuel and Kings, and at 65 chapters in length, it's a lot harder to ignore than Deuteronomy. And then you hit this huge mass of material, the prophets, the Psalms, the wisdom literature, and a bunch of other stuff that just isn't story. 
and it doesn't tell the particular story that's supposed to begin in Genesis and end in where? Revelation, I guess, in the New Testament. So no, the Old Testament does not tell a story. What about the New Testament then? I hate to break it to you, but it doesn't tell a story either. The life of Jesus is told not once, but four different times in a row. When's the last time you read a story like that? And if you ignore that bothersome fact, you could say, well, okay, the life of Jesus, though, it does continue into the story of the early church and the Acts of the Apostles. Fine, but then, just like the Old Testament, everything breaks down and all bets are off. Because after the Acts come in all the letters of Paul and letters of other people that just don't tell a story, in part because they're not stories, they're letters after all. So no, the New Testament also does not tell a story. What all that means is that when someone tells you the Bible is a story, they have simply asserted it to be so or constructed it as such. It is not obviously or necessarily so. Now, thinking about the Bible as a story makes a certain amount of sense because story is everywhere these days, isn't it? We think about everything, it seems, through the lens of story. So we have things like narrative ethics, thinking about ethics through the lens of story, or narrative counseling, narrative preaching. I imagine narrative fidget spinners are not far off in the distant future. (laughs) But the triumph of narrative and story everywhere suggests to me that it's about time to think about it and look at it with a good bit of suspicion. It just can't all be story when lots of it, frankly, isn't. So let's consider a different option for the Bible, other than story. Let's rethink the Bible, this time as poetry. Now, before we do that, I have to make an admission here, and that is to say that thinking the Bible as poetry is also an assertion, a kind of construction, just like thinking the Bible as story is. And the same would be true for every option we might suggest. But just because everything is an option or a suggestion doesn't make everything equally good. You won't be surprised to hear me say that I think poetry is the best option for at least two reasons. The first is that it avoids all those problems inherent in the Bible as story option, which I just detailed. But the other reason is that thinking the Bible as poetry offers us some great gifts that, if not unique to poetry, are at least especially pronounced there. So, thinking the Bible as poetry avoids certain problems, has less problems, and also has considerable merit. Let me mention four such merits. Four things on the Bible and poetry, if you will, all beginning with the letter C in rather poetic fashion. The first merit is candor. Candor about life, about all aspects of life that marks the greatest bits of poetry. The poet and theologian Christian Wyman has said that poetry reflects a certain density of lived experience suffered into form. Wow, not bad. Gwendolyn Brooks has boiled that down to two words, however. Poetry, she says, is life distilled. Either way, I think we could agree with Garrison Keillor when he says, good poems matter to us because they give us a truer account than we're used to getting. Honesty, density of lived experience, life distilled, those things help explain certain parts of the Bible quite well, I think. Things like the suffering of Job or the psalmist or Jesus for that matter but they also help us think about the Bible as a whole. Why does the Bible include so much about sin and suffering? And why does it have so many problems and issues recounted in there, including violence? Well, ask the moon, right? But also because that's what we expect of great poetry and what we expect of the Bible thought of as a great poem. The Bible as poetry is candid. And its most difficult parts are proof of what it, like the moon, has witnessed. Those difficult parts, therefore, are not just stories to read, let alone things to reenact, heaven forbid. Instead, those things are poetic testimonies, 
brutal, raw, bruised, truthful testimonies. Candor is the first gift of poetry. The second gift, the second merit, concerns contradictions. These are not infrequently encountered in the Bible, and they've been causing people problems for quite literally millennia. They run the gamut from things like this. Did God create the world just by speaking it into existence, as Genesis 1 would have it? Or, per Proverbs 8, did God create the world with the help of wisdom, personified as a woman? What about this one? Uh, Do we have free will in the Bible, or is God behind the scenes masterminding everything? Or um, is Christian faith largely a matter of belief apart from works, as St. Paul would seem to suggest, or is faith without deeds dead, as James says, and so on and so forth? Contradictions like this are a major problem for story approaches to the Bible because they traffic so heavily in matters of coherence, if not, in fact, logical consistency. But contradictions just aren't a problem for poetry. W.H. Auden said memorably that poetry is the clear expression of mixed feelings. Or to quote Walt Whitman's famous song of myself, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes, (laughs) including evidently a robust ego. (laughs) Thinking the Bible as poetry means contradictions aren't something to be solved, an issue to be fixed, but part and parcel of the poetics. Because to return to candor for a moment, life is like that sometimes, maybe even a lot of times. Just ask Chipotle. Not long ago, their advertising campaign was savor the contradictions. World-class ingredients at an affordable price. Hours of preparation, instantaneous service. Gourmet food you eat with your hands. (laughs) Yes, dear friends, savor the contradictions. Poetry helps us do that. The third merit I'm calling contemporaneity. By this, I mean that poetry has a way that it can be re-uttered, reused by others than just the poet who originally wrote the poem, kind of like I applied Linda Paston's poem to the Old Testament. Poetic reutterability seems to be by design, and it's facilitated by certain aspects of poetic diction, especially the use of I language. When a poet writes I, and then a reader comes along and reads I, the reader has, as it were, become the poet, inhabited the poem, reread it, remade it, and made it contemporary, made it now. Stories work this way, too, to some degree. You can read a story, a novel, and sort of try out the characters, if you will. What would I have done if I was Frodo Baggins? or Samwise Gamgee of the Shire. But that kind of example shows the problem with story identifications because few of us have hair, have feet as hairy as a hobbit. So story identifications embed a kind of difference or distance between the subject and the reader that poetry seeks to collapse. Reading and saying Frodo went to Mordor is a very different thing than saying, I am large, I contain multitudes, like Walt Whitman. Or, or uh, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, like Exodus would have it. What poetry offers us then is an event, an experience, and the Bible understood as poetry offers us the same. The Bible isn't just a, a, a story or worse, a boring history of things like Samuel in Shiloh, or David in Jerusalem, or Paul in Rome. Instead, the Bible thought of as a poem or a great collection of poems is is full of candor, often in contradiction with itself, that can become contemporary, can be read again, read now, re-uttered, remade in order to remake. And who knows that the end goal of this sort of poetic remaking won't in fact be therapeutic or salvific in some way. To quote the great Chilean poet 
Pablo Neruda in one of his love poems, he says he hopes to find himself inside poetry, emerging in the stanza, he says, cleansed of all evil. Or to quote Job, Job said, I put on righteousness like clothes. I wore justice around like a robe. Images like that, re-uttered now, show how poetry can be contemporary. The fourth merit is continuation. There's always more to say about poetry. More to say about that line from Neruda, for instance, or, or that image from Job. And that's just sort of the nature of poetry, isn't it? Billy Collins, in his poem entitled The Trouble with Poetry, says the trouble with poetry is that it just encourages the writing of more poetry. <laughs> more guppies filling the tanks. More bunnies hopping out of their moms onto the dewy grass, he says. Or consider haiku for a moment. I'm sure you're familiar with that Japanese poem form. It's popular in middle schools across the universe. <laughs> it's typically understood as a three-line poem comprised of five, seven, and five syllables, respectively, and includes some sort of image from nature. So, something like this. Brown bear in the woods. Lumbering, he walks alone. Autumn has come near. I wrote that one. <laughs> I know, I know, profound, isn't it? <laughs> but what you might not know about haiku is that originally haiku was the beginning of a poetic conference or a collaboration. One poet would utter a haiku and another poet would respond with another stanza, maybe a third would chime in, and it would go around like that, back and forth or between the three of them, adding stanzas up to a hundred stanzas in number, all within a set period of time. It's kind of the ancient equivalent of an epic rap battle, if you ask me. Now, scripture may not engender more scripture like Colin's poem would suggest or a haiku collaboration would require, but thinking the Bible as poetry means that we have to continue to come back to it in order to try to figure it out. Like a dense line from Neruda or, or an arresting image that was just the beginning of a haiku. In fact, Continuation may be the most important merit of thinking the Bible as poetry because it suggests no matter how many times we come back to it, we just never will fully figure it out. It will always remain elusive, evocative, generative, but no less powerful or transformative because of that. We too might someday find ourselves in the Bible's poetic stanza, emerging there, cleansed of all evil. We too somehow might end up putting on righteousness like clothes, wearing justice around like a jacket. So the next time someone tells you that the Bible is a story, you tell them you disagree and that it's far better to think about the Bible as a poem. When they ask you, which they inevitably will why you think that, you just tell them, Ask the moon. <laughs> and then watch and see where the conversation, maybe even the poetry, goes from there. Thank you.